All right. Uh, sorry, I've got all this electronic gear on, on me, so if, I, if I'm doing weird things with my neck, I, I apologize for that. Uh, I want to honor you for coming at 8 o'clock in the morning and signing up for an 8 a.m. class. Uh, it's a commitment on your part. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was an undergraduate, I wanted to stay up late and study late and do things late, and I dreaded 8 o'clock classes and went through all kinds of shenanigans to wake myself up early enough to come. So thank you for making it at 8 a.m. Uh, we're going to start off today just by covering uh, the syllabus. I'll remind you kind of why you're here, what's specific to this class and this section of Chem 51B. Uh, presumably all of you have had Chemistry 51A here at UC Irvine or a comparable course somewhere else. Um, and then we'll try to have a very brief review of, of what you might have covered at the end of Chemistry 51A which was almost a month ago, which seems like forever. And so let me just start off by reminding you, why are you here? Why do you come here at 8 a.m. in the morning? Why do you sign up for the Chem 51 series? And why should you care uh, beyond the reasons why people told you to care? And so I'll try to give you a sense for why I think organic chemistry is important. When you're sitting in this chair and you're learning some ridiculous thing about a chair conformation or an SN1 reaction, who really cares about that stuff? Um, and, and this is important stuff for society uh, and for your career. So probably from my perspective as an organic chemist, the number one reason why you should care about organic chemistry um, is that this is the way we cure diseases in the United States. You know, very little of that is going through and doing surgery to cure people. Um, if you have ever had a prescribed medicine and you open up the box, there's this little package insert. And when you open up that package insert, there is always an organic chemistry structure. And so you may not realize it, or you may not remember this someday when you're prescribing medicines to people and writing, scrawling some sort of hard-to-read prescription on your prescription pad or on the computer. Um, but all of these medicines that people take, that make people well um, nowadays, are based on organic molecules. And so let me just remind you of the kinds of structures. All of these molecules were designed and synthesized and are made by people just like you. They sat in a class just like you. They learned simple reactions like SN1 and SN2 reactions just like you. And then they used what they learned in those classes to design um, these novel treatments for diseases. So you may not care about this because you're not old enough to be plagued by problems like heart disease or like high blood pressure or maybe gastroesophageal reflux. Um, maybe schizophrenia. Um, of course, if you've had any sort of childhood asthma, you may have been taking Advair discus. These are all organic molecules. And so someday you're going to be prescribing medicines and it's going to be an expectation that you'll understand how those medicines work at the level of atoms and bonds. And that's why you should care. And it's also very cool, I think, to make billions of dollars a year by curing diseases. The sales for this drug Lipitor last year were $8 billion per year in the United States. $8 billion a year. That's a pretty cool thing to do with organic chemistry. Now not all of you in this class are intending to go off and, uh, and, and, and pay attention to healthcare. There's a lot of other reasons to care about organic chemistry. Our future, technology, relies on organic chemistry. You don't even know this, probably. All the different ways in which technology affects your life. So most of you have high-tech cell phones or fancy computers. Um, you may not realize that organic chemistry is what you use to synthesize or to make all the integrated circuits that go into your computers and your phones. Organic molecules are behind the optical switching that goes on to make your phones work. Let's take a look at some of the molecules that are there. All of this is based on organic chemistry. They make the chips, they do the optical switching that switches your internet very quickly. All the new displays that you hear about when you hear about that fancy phone with an AMOLED, that O stands for organic. And it's molecules like this that drive these new displays that you will see that will be the size of this screen um, and lit up. New smart materials, the plastics that go into your car, uh, smart materials that can sense the environment and repair themselves, they're all based on organic chemistry. So even if you don't care about healthcare, if you care about technology and being a part of the future, that's a good reason to care about how things work at the level of atoms and bonds, and that has to do with organic chemistry. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> at a more local level, so let's just forget about you controlling society and making billions of dollars and curing diseases and, and, and developing the future. 
You may care about just getting through this course and satisfying some sort of requirement. Most of you in this class are taking the, this, this course because ultimately you want to attend some sort of a graduate school. Medical school, dental school, optometry school. And, and people in those schools expect you to understand medicine and your world at the level of atoms and bonds. Or maybe you're going off in, in, to graduate school in organic chemistry or, or some other related chemistry field. So. Um, if you're any one of, one of these kinds of people that has an intention to go to a, some sort of a graduate or a professional school, you're probably going to be taking some review class like this in order to help you prepare so that you can compete with the other people that are out there. And they're expensive classes. But the main point behind all of these classes that will help you to do better to get entrance into dental school or pharmacy school is that they are review classes. They assume that you have already learned the material in a class like this. I've had graduate students before that have taught these classes. Excellent instructors in these classes, but I promise you they are not better than me. I promise you they're not better than me and they are not better than the TAs that support you in this course. So it is our mission in this class to help you to learn this material so that someday when you're reviewing it, it comes back better. So you have to make a commitment. Don't take the attitude, well, I just want to get through this class. And I know you have a lot of pressure. I just want to get through this class and I'll learn that stuff later. It won't be easier to learn it later. You can't learn this stuff from scratch. Those are review classes. OK, so let's talk about what this course is about. So who runs this course? Who's running this circus? Um, this course is run by the University of California at Irvine. And they hire me, and they hire the three TAs here. And that's, um, so of course, this is me, uh, Dave, or Van, Dr. Van Ranken, or Professor Van Ranken. Well, any one of those is fine. Chris, Udara, and Nick are the TAs for this class. Um, we get paid in order to teach you organic chemistry. We have committed our careers to organic chemistry and we care about it, so we want you to learn the material. We want you to do well in this class and we want you to kick butt in this class so you can go on to 51C and keep kicking butt in somebody else's section. So we're committed to that and rely on, that, uh, on us for that. Um, we have office hours throughout the week and I'll, I'll mention some of our scheduling later, but feel free we welcome you to come to our office hours and spend some time with us so we don't just sit there alone and depressed, uh, which is typically what happens. <clears throat> okay, so we're the Sherpas for this class, your Sherpas. Let me just remind you what a Sherpa is. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people talk about, oh, I want to climb Everest someday, and you'll sign up for some $30,000 mission to climb Everest. Y you don't just climb Everest. People who claim that they've climbed Everest actually had a team of Sherpas to help them climb Everest. This is an ethnic minority in Nepal, and these people grew up at high altitudes. And they know how to, they're strong at high altitudes, they don't run out of oxygen. So they spent their lives living in this environment just like me and Chris and Udara and Nick have spent our time, um, of the majority of, of my life for certain, doing organic chemistry. Now the main point behind the Sherpas who carry all the, uh, pack all the materials up to these base camps is that they do not pick people up on their shoulders and carry them to the top of Everest. It doesn't work like that. You still have to climb to the top of the mountain. Your goal in this class is to learn organic chemistry well enough to do well in Chem 51C, and then to remember that material so that later you can use it in your career, or, or at a minimum, just to gain entrance to some, uh, some graduate school or professional school. So we are here to help you make that ascent. To, to, to reach your goal. That's what we're here for. And we're good at it. So take advantage of us. Take advantage of the resources that are available to you. Okay, so here's the class. So you've all had Chem 51A. Let me just remind you. Again, it's been like a month and that seems like forever. You may think, oh, I've forgotten everything. And we'll deal with that. You haven't forgotten everything even though it seems like it. So you spent the first part of this quarter covering chapters one through eight in this Janice Gorzinski Smith Organic Chemistry textbook. Um, so hopefully all of you have the new edition. There's a second edition that's very, very similar. Um, um, I recommend that you buy the third edition, but I can't actually see any difference between the second and third edition, except that um, it, it's harder to get used copies of the new edition. Um, so here's what we're covering this quarter. So we're going to spend um, the first three or four chapters of this quarter learning lots and lots and lots of new reactions. So at the end of last quarter, in chapter 7 and 8, you learned four reactions, SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. And we are about to dump about 300 reactions on top of you this quarter. If you thought four reactions was hard, get ready. 
And this is not my choosing that I do this. This is the way the field works. This is the way the book works. This is the way the course structure works. And so we've got to get on board now to, to get you ready so that you'll be able to absorb um, all of these new reactions that we're going to cover. And just to make it hard for you, the, the book is designed, and unfortunately the course is designed so that you're going to learn a bunch of reactions and arrow pushing and mechanism, and then you're going to stop using it for a month and do something spectroscopy. NMR, IR, and you won't be using any of that stuff and then you'll forget it over that month and then we'll come back right at the end of the quarter and I'm gonna blast you with more reactions and expect you to be really fresh on the stuff that you just forgot. So I, I, I didn't invent this system. It's a dumb system, but we're stuck with it and we're gonna make it work. So I'm sorry about that. And then when you get into 51C, you're gonna have 100 million, billion, zillion reactions to remember. <clears throat> and it's doable. There's been class after class, section after section of students who have done exactly this hard stuff that I'm telling you that you're going to do. So get ready, this is us, this quarter, 51B. Okay, so uh, we already have a website for the course. That serves as our syllabus. The syllabus is kind of like a legal document. We say we're gonna do this, and we have to do it. We say you have to do this to get a certain grade. Well, that's what we have to do. So I may update this, the syllabus frequently, but if you have questions about the structure of the course, what determines my grade, or when are the discussion sections, or things like that, Go to our website and we have links for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so of course you're interested in your grade. You'd be crazy not to be interested in your grade. That determines your future and I get that. So here's what determines our grade. If I'm not mistaken, this is the same uh, grading structure that's used in, in Susan King's section and Fillmore Freeman's section. Uh, we have online homework, that's, uh, this sapling on, uh, learning online homework. That's going to be 10% of our grade. Um, then we're going to, the rest of your grade is going to be determined by exams. So two midterm exams and a final exam. And the majority of your grade will be determined, or at least uh, of these exams, the final exam is weighted more heavily because it is heavily cumulative. About half of the final exam will be new material and about half of it will be old material from, from the quarter. So many of you will be interested in it midway through the quarter. Do I have a chance? Am I going to fail? Well, a lot of that will be determined by your performance on the final exam. I can't prognosticate in that way and tell you until you've taken the final exam what your grade will be. Um, so you're right to be worried about that stuff. Um, there's no makeup e exams in this class. Don't ask me to give you a makeup exam. If I give you a makeup exam or I allow you to take the exam early, it compromises the integrity of the exam. I can't be sure that information about the exam will, will not float around to you in some way or float from you to other people. And it takes me about 8 to 12 hours to write an exam. There is a huge amount of effort in, in writing an exam to make sure that the mean isn't 10 out of 100, right? That totally demoralizes people. Or if the mean is 95 out of 100, I can't assign a grade distribution in that way. It means I made the, the exam too easy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's no makeup exams. Uh, the course grade distribution, I, when, when I've made this, this matches what happens in Susan King and Fillmore Freeman section. At the end of the quarter, we're going to get our spreadsheets and compare them and make sure we're assigning comparable grade distributions. You don't have a higher chance of getting an A or a B by going to the other sections. Um, and this was intended to, to roughly match what goes on in biological sciences. Yeah, I've got one more little disclaimer here. It says you'll automatically receive a grade of A if you make 90% or above on the final. So if the final is 500 points, you'd have to make 450 points It's uh, on the exam. I, I, I don't want you to give up ever in this class. There's always a chance. Um, but I'm confident anybody who can, no matter what happened throughout the quarter, I'm confident that if you make over 90% of the points on the, in the final exam that you know the material. I'm perfectly confident of that. And that's why I'd be willing to assign an A to you in the class. Okay, so 10% of your grade is based on sapling uh, homework. So I looked online at the Chem 51A sections for last quarter, so my understanding is that um, at least one of the sections did not use sapling. If you didn't use sapling, raise your hand just so I can make sure. Yeah, so for a significant fraction of you, you're gonna have to get online and learn this for the first time, just like everyone else did last quarter. Um, so it's pretty easy, you get online, you give them some sort of password. They know everybody who's assigned in the class. Uh, don't make a duplicate account in another class and use that to get the answers because we had to fail people last quarter for doing that. That's not okay and that's not, that, that's not fair to the rest of your peers if you're cheating in that way. The, the, what's the point behind 10% of your grade? 
The point is to keep you working on the material, even if there's not an exam, because I am just like you. If I don't have pressure to work on something, I'm going to put it off. You've got a lot of stuff going on in your lives, other courses, and I'm going to make sure with this homework that this course is one of those courses that's, that's forcing you to do stuff. So it doesn't end up with the night before the exam and that's the first time you're cracking open the book. Um, and that's not because you're crazy or irresponsible, but you've got a lot of pressures and I get that. So I'm gonna make sure that this course is one of those regular pressures um, that forces you to keep up with the material. And that's always better. Okay, and unfortunately it costs 20 extra bucks and I realize the book is really expensive and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't fix that. All of the, all of the sections are, are doing the sapling homework and I think it's a good thing. To, to allow you to sort of work with feedback. Um, we have discussion sections. These are mandatory, but we don't take grades or a role in, these, in the discussion section. The whole point behind discussion section is that we're gonna have worksheets there. You'll break into little groups and work on problems and then go present those answers at the board. You'll get a chance to see from your peers you know, gee, everybody else has the same questions as I do, or is confused about the same issues as I am, or gee, is that how you answer that kind of question? The point behind these, these discussion section worksheets is to train you to do well on my exams. I, I don't ask exam questions or recycle those questions on the exams, but we're giving you the kinds of questions that I put on exams and that other instructors put on the exams. And I want you to have training beyond the problems in the book and beyond the sapling homework for how to do well um, with questions you've never seen before. We want to train you to answer questions you've never seen. Okay, so we have discussion sections. Please go to your discussion section um, uh, if you can. If you, for some reason, missed your discussion section, you could always go to a different one. But uh, the problem is, in the past, we've had some discussion sections that had 80 people and then others with two, and we can't, we can't manage discussion sections with, in, in that way. Okay, so uh, please go to discussion sections. We're never going to give you copies of the problem set. You need to go to discussion section or get a copy from one of your friends. Don't ask us for copies of the problem set because you couldn't make it. Um, and don't ask us for the key because you're supposed to be there getting the answers and putting that on your discussion section worksheet. Okay, and once again, here's our eight o'clock class. Thank you for getting up at 8 a.m. and being here. Um, you have a lot of resources available to you. It's, it's, it's amazing to me how many resources, and it's easy to get um, overwhelmed by the number of resources. So uh, let's talk about some of the resources outside of the book and outside of the sapling and outside of the TAs and me that are available to you. So the Department of Chemistry has a peer tutoring program, and one of the key words here is free. Um, that's just one of the words. That's not the important reason to take advantage of the peer tutoring. Um, but they have people, your peers, other students who are good at acing organic chemistry. You should go to them and find out what do I need to do to ace organic chemistry the way that you did. You can go get help all throughout the week oh, uh, um, from the peer tutors. And notice that for my section, uh, there are four peer tutors that are, are yeah, four peer tutors that are specifically assigned to be in my class. Are you guys here, Imran, Mia, Jane, and Anthony? If you're here, stand up just because I want to see where. Uh... Okay, so th don't no no don't need to clap. I just want to make sure that you're here. So uh, I don't know if you guys uh, will communicate throughout the quarter, but uh, Imran, if you can come up, we're just going to do a little practice here, um, so we can see how this stuff works. I don't, I don't know about you, but I often find that I sit in my office during office hours and nobody's there. And you can't imagine the crushing disappointment when I'm sitting there and thinking, there's 300 something people in my class and yet nobody comes to my, uh, to my office hours. Okay, go ahead and pull a seat around. Let's just pretend that, that you're sitting in that office and it's, your office and it's your hours for the peer tutoring and here I am just student coming up. Oh, man. Oh, it's been such a long day, and it's been a long week, and I'm really tired. And... Hi, I'm really lost in this class. Okay, so first, what I can have you do is just sort of sign in, and um, we're just going to go over some topics that you have trouble with. And then afterwards, if you have any extra time, we can just go over our worksheet. Um, and then and if you have any other questions, we can just go from there. So do, we would just begin by first asking, asking whatever questions you have. How easy, 
That's all. <laughs> okay, how easy was that? So if you think it's too intimidating to go, and uh, thanks, Imran. <laughs> It's not intimidating to go ask for help. You can walk in and say, look, I'm just lost, or I don't know what, or why don't you just sit with me while I work some problems and see if you sit. Right? It's not hard. There's no excuse for us to be sitting there during our office hours and you guys don't come. Um, even if you just want to come, if you're on top of the material, you just want to come and work <laughs> with somebody sitting there. That's cool, too. Um, so whatever. Take advantage of that. Uh, in addition, if you'd like a more structured learning environment, would they also have these LARC peer tutoring classes where you'll be there with a group of other people and you will have another person who is excellent at acing the material. So Danny, Jeremiah, and Stephanie, or I don't know if it's Jeremy, are running these LARC tutor sessions and these are custom designed to help you ace my class. These are people who know how to ace organic chemistry and so uh, if you'd like someone to force you to come two times a week and go through the material in addition to what we're covering in, in, in this course, then take advantage of these uh, peer-assisted learning sessions that are given by LARC. And these you pay some sort of nominal fee. And of course, there's a, a time that you meet. It looks like there's one that's right after this class. So another way that you can take advantage of the resources. Uh, are, are any of you guys here right now? If so, stand up. I just want to try to gauge if, uh, OK, cool. So I don't, um, so thanks for coming. To lecture and these guys are here to help you do well in the class so take advantage of that and sign up so that there's no uh, open seats in there okay so uh, if you have questions about anything that's going on in this class um, feel free to ask me after class I'll hang out for a little bit so you can ask questions um, ask me during my office hours please go to my office hours and take advantage of that if you can't go to my office hours go to Chris's office hours or Dara's or Nick's office hours we can answer whatever questions you have about how things are graded or if you need help with the, the course content but I'm going to ask you do not send me email questions about chemistry I, I can't read email questions about chemistry I can't write you answers about organic chemistry yeah, sometimes I get emails from people, or I used to before I had this policy, where people would try to explain using a, a, the, the keyboard some complex question about a structure that could have been drawn in five seconds. Okay, so that, I appreciate the fact that this person spent four paragraphs to try to explain a chemical structure, but I don't know how to write out a, a paragraph back about a chemical structure. I, I feel like, gee, I could have written this in five seconds. So, the way to, to get answers about chemistry is to come to my office hours or to the TA's office hours or to the, the peer tutoring session office hours or to your LARC tutor uh, and get some help. So I understand sometimes it's late at night and you're working through some problem and you get stuck and you feel like the whole world has stopped until you get that answer. You need to just move on to some other material and get up on that. Right? Get over it. You, the world will not stop if you can't get that one answer at that time. Uh, and sometimes questions are just too brief. I can't possibly answer questions that, right, that's not. So the worst situation in the world is if, if, if you know, you might ask, well, why don't you just ignore those emails? You do not want to have a professor who's in, who ignores their emails, right? I, I want to be responsive with email, but that means I need to, to make sure that the emails that come to me have been pre-filtered in some way. Okay, here's the last uh, piece of advice I'll give you for this quarter and for your life. Uh, this is a quote by Benjamin Franklin, who was an amazing scientist and statesman and founding father of the country. And what he said was, drive thy business. Drive thy business. For you sitting in this class, organic chemistry is your business, and specifically chapters 9 through 18 are your business. As, as some sort of a student, your student career is your business. Getting a degree is your business. Somebody lent you money. Somebody is paying, or somebody is paying for you to go to school, or else you're off working your tail off in order to make enough money to afford these classes. You're investing in your career. Make that pay off. That's your business, to take the money that's been invested and somehow pay it back by getting a good enough job or having a good enough career to pay those people back that helped you to spend that, uh, to, to help you get this education. So drive that business. And the more important part about this quote is the second part. And that is, drive thy business, or it will drive thee. That's the full quote. If you don't get on top of the material, 
and stay on top of the material, I promise you it is going to be driving your ass through the rest of the quarter. And you know this to be true. We all know what it's like to fall behind and then suddenly, oh god, there's another deadline and I'm not even ready. So this is easy for me to say and it's tough to do and it's all about self-discipline. It means when you get out of this lecture today or, if you, or whenever you're done with your lectures this morning, go right to the library or somewhere and start studying. The second you get out of class, start studying. And don't think that that can wait. So again, you want to be in the driver's seat. I want you to be in the driver's seat. Um, and this is true for the rest of your life. Drive thy business, or it will drive you. OK, we have just a few moments before um, the end of the lecture. So let's go ahead and stop and, um, um, and talk a little bit about what's going on at the end of organic chemistry from last quarter. So I'm, for most of the, the quarter, I'm going to be using this doc cam. Uh, I actually prefer chalk, but it's, uh, I've, I was told specifically by students that they can't see, even with the big chalk, what I'm writing on these chalkboards. So um, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to start off with a review of Chem 51A. Uh, just very briefly, the reactions that you learned at the end of the quarter. Uh, and so you can go ahead and take something out and take some notes if you want to. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to get a room for this Saturday, this coming Saturday. So we're going to have something called a boot camp, just a review of Chem 51. It's like, what happens if you enter this quarter and you're totally lost? There's no free ride. You, you, you can't not learn the material of Chem 51A and expect to do well in Chem 51B. At some point, you've got to master that material. And so if you felt like you left Chem 51A totally confused, then let's spend Saturday morning together and get you back on tracks so that you can kick butt in this class. That's our goal. But for now, let me just remind you of the stuff that you learned at the end of the quarter. Uh, last quarter, uh, um, I, I look at what goes on. It's, there were two things about the end of last quarter that are, um, I would say, really demoralizing. For, for me, from my perspective, and I have a lot of perspective having done two decades of organic chemistry, um, the, what, go, what you learn in chapters 7 and 8, this SN1, SN2, E1, E2 business, is probably the hardest stuff in all of organic chemistry. It's the hardest and most confusing nightmare, and I don't know why we ended the first quarter with that. If you left that stuff feeling totally confused, it's like, is it SN1 or SN E1? I, I don't know. I can't figure that stuff out. It's so hard. So um, I, I'm sorry that you spent the end of last quarter um, just lost in that morass, but um, there's nothing I can do about that. Except we're going to try to walk through some reactions in this little bit of time we have. There's a second key thing that happened at the end of last quarter, and that is that the book started to transition to line drawings. So in other words, you went uh, from having all the structures drawn out for you like this, to suddenly they were just drawing the structures like that. And for some of you, you did not pick that up. You did not pick up this skill of counting to four bonds to carbon. One, two, three, four, and instantly recognizing where the hydrogen atoms are. If you are not instantly excellent with this kind of rapidity, recognizing how many hydrogens are in every single carbon atom, you're doomed to failure. You're doomed to failure in Chem 51B, and you're doomed to failure in Chem 51A. So when I draw structures like this down below, without the hydrogen atoms for you, I expect you to instantly know how many hydrogens are attached to each carbon. Because in 30% of the reactions that you will see in the, in the coming quarter and the end of the quarter, you need to know where those hydrogens are. They are part of the mechanism. And that's why that kind of instantaneous recognition becomes important. So on top of all this confusion about E1 and E2 and SN1 and SN2, the books started to, to, to go to these line structures that don't have all the atoms drawn. And so you just have to, you have to practice that until you're excellent. OK, so um, I just want to mention one thing about chapter one that's important. Um, just to talk about one of the things that, that I, it's a skill that I think is important that has to do with what's important about Chem 51. I expect you to know trends in electronegativity. Your understanding of which nucleophiles are excellent and which ones are pathetic, which bases are strong and which ones are weak really does boil down to an understanding of electronegativity. And this is a really simple, mostly simple kind of idea to master. And uh, let me just remind you that there's an important trend in electronegativity as you walk across the periodic table. Um, 
So as we walk in this direction across the periodic table, and in particular here for the second row atoms, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, there's a monotonic increase in electronegativity that makes those atoms want to have more electron density and more negative charge. And so let me just write down um, a series of increasing electronegativities for you. So of these atoms in the second row, lithium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, lithium is the least electronegative. It does, doesn't really want electrons. <clears throat> and so that's less electronegative than boron. We're going to see some boron chemistry this quarter. And that's less electronegative than carbon. And that's less electronegative than nitrogen. See, I'm just marching across the periodic table here. Boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. That's less electronegative than oxygen. And that's less electronegative than fluorine, which we really aren't going to see, which is too bad because fluorine appears in a, a, over half of, of the pharmaceuticals that are prescribed nowadays. Uh, but fluorine is, is its own weird beast. Okay, so the hard part. This is super easy. You can just look at a periodic table. There's one over there on the wall that will be there when you take the exam. Right? There's, that shows this trend, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So fluorine is the most electronegative. Lithium is the least. But the harder thing for you to know is that hydrogen, where does that fit? It's not a second row atom. It is just a little bit less electronegative than carbon. It's a little bit more electropositive than carbon. Things that have a lot of negative charge would prefer to attack a proton over a carbon by a little bit. So protons are a little bit more electropositive than carbon. So, I mean, maybe you can write a delta plus there, but it's just slight. It's slight, but it's significant. Okay, the other atoms that you need to know that are important for chapters 7 and 8 from last quarter were the halogens. And this, because they're not second row atoms, it's hard to know where they fall in this sort of series. And so uh, what I'll remind you of is that if you compare the halogen chlorine, it, let's drop down to the third row, chlorine, that has the same electronegativity as nitrogen. And it has to do with the fact that this the, uh, um, atomic radius and atomic size. Bromine is just a little bit less electronegative than chlorine. And iodine is a little bit less electronegative uh, than bromine. So I'm trying to draw nitrogen is the same as chlorine. Bromine is a little less electronegative. And iodine is a little less electronegative. But they are all more electronegative than carbon. All of these would love to have electrons more than carbon would. And that's why I... CL and BR acted as anionic leaving groups uh, in chapters uh, 7 and 8 last quarter. Okay, so the, the practical consequence of this, let's go ahead and draw out a, a, a simple reaction here. I'm going to draw out a carbon atom with a bond to a halogen. In this case, it'll be chlorine. When this bond dissociates, when this carbon-chlorine bond dissociates apart, we have to think about two different ways that we can um, let those electrons part company with the atoms. One way would be like this, to give the electrons to chlorine, and the other way would be to give the electrons to carbon. These are the two choices that we have. And of those two choices, just based on electronegativity, if you understand electronegativity, just by looking at a periodic table, if all you have available to you is a periodic table, then your prediction should be that it's this red pathway that is preferred that you want to give the electrons to chlorine because chlorine is, is the most electronegative out of chlorine and carbon. And so, of the things that we want to have a positive charge, we do not want the chlorine to have a positive charge. That simple yet powerful idea guides everything from chapters 7 and 8, where you have leaving groups, where you introduce to this idea of leaving groups. And it also, this electronegativity concepts guides your understanding um, should guide your understanding of which things are, are, are good nucleophiles or not. I'm trying to draw an X here through this blue line. Yeah, so you don't give the electrons to carbon. You give the electrons to the electronegative atom. We are going to use this, this concept of leaving groups and the importance of electronegativity over and over and over and over again uh, throughout the quarter. So, and throughout the, the next quarter after that in Chem 51C. And so you have to be prepared for that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, I want to review for you some reactions from chapters 7 and 8 from last quarter. 
to remind you that you didn't totally forget everything and, and just to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, that was really confusing stuff, the way it was presented. Um, or, or maybe it's not so much the way it was presented, it was just confusing stuff. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and talk about um, reactions of primary and secondary alkyl halides. And I want to start off by considering the case of strong nucleophiles. Let's take an example of a, of a species that I would consider to be a strong nucleophile. Here's a thiolate anion. Cysteine, the amino acid cysteine that you find in, in human proteins or in the small molecule glutathione is a thiolate anion. And it's the most potent nucleophile of any that you find in the human cell. <clears throat> and if I take that powerful nucleophile and I put that in the presence of an electrophile, then what happens is that you can expect that thiolate anion to attack something. It's either going to attack a proton or it's going to attack a carbon. Now there's one key about thiolate anions that makes them so, um, so prominent as nucleophiles is that even though they are, are prominent nucleophiles, they're not super strong bases. That, that negative charge is spread out over a huge atom. Sulfur is a third row atom. And so what happens is because there's not a lot of focused negative charge, you can expect the thiolate anion to engage in an SN2 reaction like this. So you learned SN2 reactions. These are characteristics of things that are very strong nucleophiles and it's better if they're not strongly basic. Okay, so what are some other examples of things that you should expect to engage in SN2 reactions? Other things uh, that are strong nucleophiles. Um, let's go ahead and write out a list of other um, uh, of other types of species. Alkoxides, get ready, chapter 9 is going to be that over and over and over again. Okay, you know the SN2 reaction, let's use alkoxide. How easy is that? That's chapter 9, over and over again until we're tired of it. We love making carbon-carbon bonds, and at least organic chemists do. Cyanide anion is anionic on carbon. And when that acts as an SN2 nucleophile, it makes carbon-carbon bonds. So obviously I love that, and your TAs love that, and the tutors love that. Carboxylates, they're not super nucleophilic or basic, um, but you can use those to make oxygen-carbon bonds. And then the last common, common ones in this list are the halogens, iodide and bromide. And I'm only drawing one of the lone pairs out because I like to see these lone pairs here because that's what's doing the SN2 attack. Okay, so those are examples of, um, um, those are examples of, uh, of nucleophiles that you should expect to, to do SN2 reactions with primary or secondary alkyl halides. So once you get to tertiary alkyl halides, things become too hindered to do SN2 reactions. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. Okay, so what about things that are strongly basic? Let's take an example of a species that, uh, that to me just screams basicity. Here's one that you, here's a species that you haven't seen before, but you are going to see uh, coming up in chapter, I think 11 on alkynes, you're going to see this species and it is used for ripping protons off of things. Amazingly basic, amazingly basic. And 20 orders of magnitude, one with 20 zeros, more basic than an alkoxide anion. And so when you expose this to the same electrophile that I drew up above, it doesn't go after the carbon atom, it goes after a proton. Remember, protons are just a little bit more electropositive. And so here, with bases, th these respond to the negative charge. So if I take this super duper duper, and it is nucleophilic, but it's the basicity that takes over. It now rips the proton off, and you still have this, the iodide act as a leaving group. And then that's an E2 reaction. And so the products of this, you now have a new NH bond that you didn't have before, and you have a CC double bond. And really, the focal point of this process here is that you pulled a proton off. That's why it's important for you to see protons. So what are some examples of some other species that act as, uh, um, that, that are used for E2 reactions? Um, here's some typical ones. Oh, and let me just say that some of the properties that make a, a, a reagent good uh, for E2 reactions, if you want to have an E2 reaction, 
Hindrance will slow down attack at carbon. Or things that are weakly nucleophilic will slow down attack at carbon. What you really want is lots of negative charge. So the typical kinds of bases, there's really only two typical bases that you, you'll see used um, uh, for E2 reactions in this early part of the, the quarter. One is T-butoxide anion, and we're going to see more of this throughout the quarter. So there's T-butoxide, and it's almost always potassium T-butoxide. It's sterically hindered. It makes it hard for, it, for that O- minus to wiggle its way in and attack the carbon. Um, and so it goes after the proton, which is very accessible. The other common base, I'm not going to draw the structure for you, is a nitrogen base called uh, DBU. It stands for di diaza bicycloundesevenine, which is totally meaningless to you. You just need to know DBU. It's, it's an amine base with a nitrogen lone pair, and it's very hindered. So, you just, so if you see DBU, it's being used to pull off a proton. That's the only reason it is ever used in organic chemistry. And you don't need to know about the structure for that. Okay, I don't quite have time to, um, to finish up this last. So here's what I, I've talked about. I, I've just given you a very, very quick review of reactions of primary and secondary alkyl halides. When we come back on, on Wednesday, I'm going to finish up this little micro re review and tell you what happens with a tertiary alkyl halide. What happens if I take super strongly nucleophilic things or or, or what, what kinds of reactions should I expect from tertiary alkylides? And of course, that's going to be SN1 and E1 reactions. And we'll finish that up. Okay, so you haven't forgotten everything from chapter 7 and 8. When you leave here today, go back to chapter 7 and 8 and work problems from the backs of those chapters. Right? Get excellent at that because we're going to be using those same reactions in chapter 9. That's how you're going to be on top of the material when we get to chapter 9.